So at this time, uh, we will turn our attention to God's Word, and as I mentioned earlier, this is not a sermon that I wrote, uh, but we pray that we'll be blessed by it. So if you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to turn to the prophet Zephaniah, Zephaniah chapter 3, and I'm actually going to start a couple verses earlier than 14. I'll start at verse 11, and then we'll read just to the end of the chapter, so verse 20. Uh, If you're looking for it in your Bibles, you can find the prophet Zephaniah kind of close to the center of your Bible, uh, maybe a little closer to the New Testament, um, just before the prophet Haggai in the Minor Prophets. So Zephaniah chapter 3, beginning at verse 11. This is God's word. On that day you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove from your midst your proudly exultant ones, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. But I will leave in your midst a people humble and lowly. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord. Those who are left in Israel, they shall do no injustice and speak no lies. Nor shall there be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue. For they shall graze and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time, I will deal with all your oppressors and I will save the lame and gather the outcast and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you in at, that to- at the time when I gather you together for I will make you renowned and praised among the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. This is God's holy word. May he write it on our hearts this morning as we meditate on it together. Well, beloved in the Lord Jesus Christ, why do Christians sing? Singing is a big part of our worship together. When we come together on the Lord's Day, we come in part to sing to God. We've already sung four songs together, and God's covenant people all throughout Scripture have been a singing people in the Bible. God gave his people a whole book that is dedicated to prayer and to song, the book of Psalms that expresses the whole range of human emotions. The Psalms express joy and sorrow. They express thanksgiving and anxiety. Our mighty God wants us to sing because he wants us to express all of our emotions, all that we are to him. Moreover, singing helps the truth of God's word to dwell even deeper in our hearts. Martin Luther, the great reformer of the 16th century, was himself passionately committed to the importance of spreading the gospel even through song. And in his typical Luther fashion, he put it this way, I have no use for cranks who despise music, because it is a gift of God. Music drives away the devil and makes people merry. They forget thereby all wrath, unchastity, arrogance, and the like. Next, after theology, I give music the highest place of honor. Music is so important because when we sing, our hearts are joined to God in a deeper way. We're able to give sound and voice to our emotions. As human beings, you know, isn't it true that sometimes we can come to church feeling a certain way, perhaps holding inside certain emotions? Because life is busy and we don't always have time to process things before the Lord and how we're doing. Perhaps our minds are not in the right frame of mind. Our perspective is off But when we come and we begin to sing, and we sing of God's faithfulness, we sing of God's greatness, we find these emotions coming out. We find them flowing out of us as we lift up our voices to God and sing. Our hearts begin to be ministered to by God and his truth as we think about his faithfulness. Well, this morning, Zephaniah summons the people of God to sing. And he calls them, actually, to rejoice and exult in the face of very difficult and dark circumstances. Today we want to think about why it is that we are commanded and called to do the same. And as we consider this text, we're going to look primarily at two things. 
we're going to consider this call to rejoice and really what's the nature of this call to rejoice. And second, we're going to look at a number of reasons why we can rejoice and sing. This morning, may we be encouraged and enlivened by God's word to sing to him not only with reverence and awe, but also with joy and thanksgiving. And so our first point, beloved, is in verse 14. You'll look there in your Bibles and see there the call to rejoice. I'll read it again for us. Zephaniah says, Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. A couple of things I want to bring out for you about this call to rejoice. First, this call to rejoice is unexpected. It's unexpected. If you've read the book of Zephaniah before, if you've read it up until this point in chapter 3, it's a very, very, very dark book. Consider the opening verses of the book of Zephaniah, chapter 1, verses 2 through 3. The Lord says, I will utterly consume everything from the face of the land, says the Lord. I will consume man and beasts. I will consume the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, and the stumbling blocks along with the wicked. I will cut off man from the face of the earth, says the Lord. This is a catastrophic and cosmic judgment that God is about to bring. And you'll notice, even echoing Genesis 1 and 2, it's really the undoing of creation. God is undoing the created order as his judgment comes to fall on mankind. And it's not just judgment on all the wicked nations out there. Notice verse 4 of chapter 1. The Lord says, I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. You see, Zephaniah was a prophet during the time of Josiah. If you know a little bit about him, he was a good king, right? But the people still struggled, even under Josiah, to obey the Lord and to be faithful to God in his covenant. And in this time of, Josiah's, of Zephaniah's prophecy, the northern kingdom of Israel had already fallen in 722 BC because of their sins. And now the southern kingdom was about to face the same judgments because they're going in the same way of rebellion against God. And we know the story of scripture. God's judgment would fall on them when Babylon would destroy Jerusalem in 586 BC. And so dark and difficult circumstances were about to come upon God's people. Soon, the people are going to face God's real judgment. And these judgments are announced all through Zephaniah, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. But here, in the midst of all the judgments that are being spoken of, out of nowhere, it seems, Zephaniah begins to speak a word of hope and a word of blessing, not only for Israel, but for all the nations. In chapter 3, verse 9, God shows that his determination is to gather the nations. And later on, the Lord says, I will restore the peoples a pure language that they may call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. Notice, the Lord has a purpose of restoring the nations, and he calls his people then to sing and to shout and to rejoice. Because, verse 15, he's going to take away the judgments that are on them. Notice, the prophet here looks forward, doesn't he? with the people to a day when God would remove his judgment from his people. A day when God would save them again and free them from their enemies. And the people of God, notice, they were to sing in anticipation of this great day of salvation. They were to sing as if it had already come to pass, because God's word is certain to come to pass. And as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, we rejoice in how this text of scripture applies to us. Because we're comforted as God's people to see God's faithfulness to us in Jesus Christ. This morning we remember that God calls us to sing and to rejoice because he has taken away his judgment. Not only upon nations like Judah and Jerusalem, but he's taken his judgment off of us in Jesus Christ when he died on the cross for our sins. It is in Jesus we confess from Psalm 103 that our sins are removed as far as the east is from the west so that we bear them no more and we can praise the Lord. The remnant of Israel on Zephaniah's day, they were to look forward to the day of salvation, and in anticipation, they were to sing. As the church, we look back to that cross when God's judgment was taken away, but we also look forward as well to that day of final deliverance that is still to come. And so this call to rejoice, it was unexpected, 
in the midst of this great catastrophic judgment, God calls his people to sing. But second, you'll notice as well from verse 14, this is a call to excessive praise. The nature of this call, it's unexpected, and it's also a call to excessive praise. The people of God here are called to sing, to shout, and to greatly rejoice in God. These three terms together speak of a kind of extravagant, unashamed worship that God's people are to give to the Lord because he has lavished on them such a great salvation. You know, you and I as human beings, we're able to give excessive praise in different settings, right? Some of us might be sports fans, and what do we do when our team finally wins the championship of the big game? We, we step out of our reform bubble and maybe become a little more Pentecostal on those days, right? A little more dancing and shouting and high-fiving and rejoicing with the people around us. Or if our guy wins the election, right? The political leader that we love so much, and he wins the election, we rejoice. We parade it. We tell people on Facebook. We shout with other like-minded people about this victory that we got to enjoy. And really what Zephaniah is saying is, how much more should we celebrate and rejoice than in the victory of our God in Jesus Christ? The kind of salvation that God has accomplished in Jesus Christ leads people not to a stoic kind of lifestyle before God, but to a life of worship that celebrates the victory of Jesus Christ. So Zephaniah says, sing. And he says, shout. I don't think we need a Hebrew professor here this morning to tell us what the word shout means. I think we all understand what it means to shout. But for this word shout, it's actually really rich in the Old Testament. It's a shout that was often associated with a battle cry that Israel would lift up when they were at war. As Israel saw enemies around them, they were to shout to God, their warrior king, their great defender and deliverer. Here, let me just read a couple of scriptures for you this morning. Joshua commanded the people when they went against Jericho in Joshua 6, verse 10, with these words. He says, You shall not shout or make your voice heard, neither shall any word go from your mouth, until the day that I tell you to shout. Then you shall shout. And again, in 2 Chronicles 13, we read this. And when Judah looked, behold, the battle was in front of them and behind them, and they cried to the Lord, and the priests blew the trumpets. Then the men of Judah raised the battle shout. And when the men of Judah shouted, God delivered Jeroboam and all of Israel before Abijah and Judah. You see that? When the people shouted to God, their warrior king, in the midst of enemies, in the midst of battle, God the deliverer came, and he helped them in their time of need. God says, in the midst of enemies, shout to me, because I am God. I am your defender. I am your deliverer. And Church of Jesus Christ, today is still the day of shouting in that way. We still have, on this side of heaven, many enemies as Christians. Not just enemies in the culture and people that might oppose Christianity, Christianity, but we also have the enemies of sin dwelling within us. We have the enemies of things that we've prayed for, of illness and sickness, of those natural evils that fall upon us as well. Things like pandemics and different seasons of life that test us. And when we come to church feeling vulnerable, when we come to church feeling attacked on all these different fronts, individually or as families, God says we are to lift up that battle shout, to sing and to shout to God in the midst of our trials, trusting that he is our deliverer, that he is our God. Notice the Lord says, sing, shout, and then the third commandment, greatly rejoice, greatly rejoice in God. This last call carries the imagery of someone spinning around and dancing in celebration. Again, this is a call to excessive, unashamed praise. Because that is what God is worthy of. You know, often in the Bible, when you see people come into contact with God's grace, they respond in this kind of way. In the Old Testament, you could think of King David, a mighty man of war, right? A man who delivered, defeated Goliath and lions, a strong man of God. But he danced before the Lord, didn't he? 2 Samuel 6. And sure, people looked at this man funny, including Saul's daughter, but God was pleased with his unashamed worship. Moreover, in the New Testament, in Luke 7, we read of a sinful woman who was forgiven, and she went and she wept at the very feet of Jesus in the presence of many people. Remember how she wept over his feet? She wiped the Lord Jesus' feet with her hair. She wet his feet with her tears. 
She kissed his feet. She anointed them. This was intimate. This was personal. This was unashamed worship that flowed from a heart that was touched by grace. See, beloved, those who know God's forgiveness, celebrate that forgiveness. Celebrate the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter your personality type. Those who come in contact with the grace of Jesus give to God unashamed worship with all their hearts. Again, as human beings, we're able to get excited about many things. Our pay raises, our sports teams, birthdays, graduations, sickness being taken away. We rightly celebrate these things. We give thanks for these things. But how much more should we celebrate our salvation in Jesus Christ? How much more this morning should we celebrate that our sins are forgiven? That in Christ, God has removed his judgment from us. How much more should we celebrate that God calls us sons and daughters? That he actually says, you're part of my family, and I've prepared a home, an eternal home. Just like the people in Zephaniah's day, we have reasons to rejoice in God. And so, people of God, hear the word of the Lord for you this morning from Zephaniah. To lift up your voice, to sing, to shout, and to greatly rejoice in the God who is worthy of all our praise. Let people be small in your eyes, and God be big in your eyes. Let his glory and his salvation be what fills your heart as you sing, as you rejoice, even in the midst of trials, because God is worthy of our praise. This is the call to rejoice that God gives us this morning. It's unexpected. It's excessive. But why do we sing? What are some, of, what are some reasons for our rejoicing this morning? And for that, we'll turn to verse 17. There's two reasons that we see here. Let's read verse 17 once again. Zephaniah says, The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save you. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. There's two reasons I want to highlight for you this morning. The first one will just make a little bit more of a briefer point. The first reason that we are called to rejoice is because of God's powerful presence with us. Zephaniah says, the Lord your God is in your midst. Now again, remember the context. Think about how that would have encouraged the people of God. Soon they were about to have enemies oppress them and they would have no mighty king like David to be in their midst to defend them and to fight for them. But God says to his people, I am your king. The Lord your God is in your midst and I will be with you. Not in my judgment at this time, but I will be with you in my grace. I will be in your midst that you might never again fear evil for the people in Zephaniah's day. This was good news because the judgments that were about to come were real. Physical judgments of nations overthrowing them and humbling them to the dust. But God says, I will be your king. I will be in your midst. I will save you. I will help you. And God is still near, beloved, to his church. God came to us in Jesus Christ to truly be in our midst in the flesh. The angel said to Mary, Rejoice, the Lord is with you. And the name given to our Savior was the name Jesus, which means God saves. He saves us from our sins. He saves from the very judgment of God. And even after the resurrection and bodily ascension of Jesus in heaven, Jesus promised to be with us to the end of the age. He is the King of kings who fights for his people, who guides us, and who is always with us by the power of the Holy Spirit to preserve us in our pilgrim journey. And today, today we sing. One of the reasons we rejoice is because we confess that God is present with us. He's in the midst even of our trials when we go through times of suffering or times of refining. God is in our midst. He's here with us by his Spirit. And so we rejoice. But I want to think about the second reason that we rejoice from Zephaniah. Not only is he powerfully present here with us, but notice what Zephaniah says. God is actually passionate for us. In verse 14, we are called to rejoice, but now we're told something amazing about God in verse 17. That he actually rejoices over us. He will rejoice over you. With gladness, he will quiet you with his love, and he will rejoice over you. With loud singing, or in other translations, with joyful songs, or shouts 
of joy. Dear Christian, what does God think of when he thinks of you? And if God were to speak of you to someone else, you know, if we could put it in that light, what would he say about you? What would God tell someone else about you? I actually asked a Christian that not too long ago. What do you think when you think, I've got thoughts towards you? And this person said, I think God would say he's tired of me. I think he would say he's tired of putting up with me. And he's disappointed with me. And I think we can kind of sympathize with that response. We often feel in our own hearts that God's probably just fed up with me. If you were to write down on your bulletin a couple of words that you think God thinks about you, what would you write down? Maybe you'd write down disappointed, disgusted with me, fed up with me. You know, we struggle. Some of, even some of us who have been walking with the Lord for so many years, and perhaps we struggle with assurance. We struggle and we wonder, Lord, how can you actually really love me? How can you really love me when you see, even still after all these years, how much of a sinner I still am? How much I fall short of your glory every single day. Well, here's a verse in your Bible, beloved, that you want to underline. Here's a verse you want to memorize. Here's a verse you want to preach to yourself when you find yourself beat up by life and feeling like you don't actually matter to God. One Bible scholar says that this is the John 3.16 of the Old Testament because it's a verse that declares the passionate love of God for his people. And what does it say? God delights in his people so much that he sings. Do you believe that this morning? That God delights in his people so much that he sings? Does God sing? A voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. God spoke audibly for people to hear. See, all of our singing, all of our rejoicing is really just an echo of this great song of delight that God sings over his people. You know, I think, beloved, I know for myself, one of the main reasons we don't always long for intimacy with God in our times of prayer, our times of personal worship, is because we think that God's repulsed by us. Think about it in human relationships. You don't want to spend time with people you think don't like you very much. But if you feel like people are just kind of putting up with you, you don't really want to hang out with them, right? I remember early on in my marriage, my wife confessing to me, honey, I know you love me, but I'm not sure that you like me very much. She was being very honest. And when we feel that way about someone, we don't want to be in their presence, right? Same is true with God. We will never draw near to God with joy and unashamed worship so long as we think God is disgusted by us. We must believe in verse 17 that God sings songs of joy over us because he delights in us. What a verse. God says, I want you to rejoice because I rejoice over you. This is not the God of deism who's disconnected from the world, you know, who created it and walked away. This isn't the God of Star Wars, right? Some impersonal force that's just behind the universe moving things. No. This is the covenant God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who sings songs of joy over his blood-bought children. Notice the imagery here. He will rejoice over you with gladness. That imagery in the Bible is connected with how a bridegroom rejoices over his bride. I've had six weddings to go to this summer. You know what it's like to go to a wedding, and you know what it's like to see that beautiful moment in the ceremony when the bride is walking down the aisle. And as a pastor, when I'm officiating, I'm often looking right at the groom and just seeing how he's doing, you know, making sure he doesn't fall down or anything. And, you know, often they're they're shaking a little bit or they're sweaty or sometimes they're just smiling and you're just, you know, overwhelmed by the moment as they see their bride walking down the aisle. And for some of you married men, think about how you felt on that day when you saw your bride coming down the aisle. Think about the emotions that filled your heart Well, this is the heart of Christ towards his church. Isaiah 62, verse 5. As the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall God rejoice over you. The second imagery here is that of a parent quieting their child with their songs. 
Notice, he will quiet you with his love. You know what it's like as a parent to put your kids down for bed, and maybe when you put your kids down for bed, you sing to them. You try to quiet them down a little bit after a busy day, and you sing songs over them. You delight in that moment with them. You rejoice over them. Zephaniah says, this is God's heart towards his children. He will quiet you with his love. Why is that so important? Because our hearts, beloved, object to everything I'm saying this morning, everything that God's word is saying. We object to this. And we say, no, our sin is too frequent. It's too obvious. God sees all these things. No way he could see it and actually delight in me. But read verse 15. God says, if you are in Christ, your judgment is taken away. Perhaps we say, I feel so much shame this morning because of my sin. I know how dirty I am. I don't even love myself because I know of what I do. What I do. Read verse 19. I will change their shame to praise and renown in all the earth. God is in the business of covering our shame, and he does so with the righteousness of Jesus Christ given to us by faith that he might be seen that we might be seen as pure in his sight. Well, perhaps you say, you know, this is probably true. This is God's love, but it's for other people. It's not for me. You don't know how many times I've failed as a parent or a church leader or a spouse or a child. Zephaniah says, he will quiet you with his love. God's love in the gospel quiets the objections of our heart. God's love quiets us and reminds us that his grace is greater than all of our sin. You see, God doesn't take our sin lightly. He's holy and just. But he has dealt with our sins at the cross of Jesus Christ. Jesus suffered on the cross and cried out as one forsaken by the Father that we might sing as those accepted by grace. We sing with shouts of joy because he shouted as one forsaken when our sins were laid on his shoulder. So now... God's love for us and the gospel quiets our heart. As he reminds us, his grace is greater than all of our sins. This morning, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, if you've never called on the Lord for salvation, why would you want to push away a God like this? Why live your life for things that leave you sad and miserable in the end? God says to us this morning through his word, Buy into my love that is given freely to all who confess their sins and look to Jesus Christ. If we confess our sins to God and we look to Jesus, the word of God says he will put a new song in our mouth. He will put a new song in our hearts. He will fill us with his love. So people of God, sing to the Lord because your God sings over you. Shout with the voice of triumph to your God. And in the midst of your struggles and even in the midst of your battles, know that he loves you. Because God is powerfully present. He is in our midst. And so may we thank him and praise him, not just with our lips, but with our lives as we offer ourselves a sacrifice of praise to him. Let's pray. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, we pray with the psalmist that you would open our lips, that our mouths might praise you for your steadfast love is better than life. Help our lips to praise your name. Help us to bless you as long as we live. Help us to lift up our hands in your name. We thank you for the love that you have shown us in Jesus Christ. We thank you for his willingness to come and to experience what it means to be turned away from. We pray that we might know all of this in our trials as well. When we sing and we pray to you and our, with our struggles, you will never turn away from us, but you will look on us favorably and you will show us your love and your care. As you bring us all the way home to glory, we thank you for this time of worship where we could hear your word and be instructed by your word, but also, Lord, this time when we can sing and offer to you our praise and our thanksgiving. May it be acceptable in your sight this morning as we bring them to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray, amen. Well, I think...